Good, good day. I see it's exactly noon. Sisters and brother, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As usual, it's a great pleasure to be with God's people and around God's word. Today we intend to explore disciple making part three and in doing so we are going to be dealing with the world the flesh and the devil as enemies of the heart when we examine the text we will notice that these what appears to be three enemies is intertwined as one and John the Elder uses one term and that is the word to describe what we see as the world the flesh and the devil the text reads first John chapter 2 verse 15 to 17 do not love the world or the things in the world and here is reason number one the love of the father is not in those who love the world For all that is in the world, and here is the idea of the flesh, the desire of the flesh, and the desire of the eyes, the pride of riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So he is re-emphasizing reason number one. And here is reason number two. And the world and its desire are passing away. But those who do the will of God live forever. So the world is transitory because it is built on illusions, appearing as real, but is there to deceive us thinking that we have that which is substantial and satisfactory when it is not it is passing away it is fleeting like vapor like a mist it is passing away but those who do the will of God live forever no wonder one commentator labels this a conflict between the world and the will of God. You notice the verse, the paragraph begins with do not love the world. And it ends, but those who do the will of God live forever by observation you will also notice that in this brief paragraph the elder or the translation of what the elder wrote gives us mention of the world six times do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world. The desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride of riches. Come not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires are passing away. So you will understand as we proceed that we'll be talking more about the world 
than about the flesh and the devil. But when we talk about the world, we are talking about the flesh and the devil. As we will discover as we proceed. Now, one of the things that you will observe if, like me, you have been reading from chapter 1, you will notice that at this juncture, uh, the writer, John the Elder, moves very carefully from descriptions to direction or directives. Because so far, he has been describing what the genuine, authentic church looks like or should look like. For And the reason I think he does this is that if we know who we are, we will know how to behave. I learned that lesson the hard way when I was in high school. For some reason, my house mistress that's more highly than I she passing by her door, going to the detention room. The dissension room because I had misbehaved. And for her, without knowing what I did, it was out of character. And so she sent a message to me. I was, my imposition, my punishment was to write 500 lines. Now, that in itself was steep, but not so steep. Because once I know what the lines were, my friends would help me write it. While they are in class, they would help me write the lines. But this time I ask her, what should I write? And she said, well, you should know what to write. In other words, think of who you are. And think of how unlike who you are, you behave. And write a line stating that. Or write 500 lines rather stating that. And that was the hardest detention, the hardest punishment I, I had. Because one, I had to construct the line. And two, I didn't get a chance to communicate that to my friends so they could help me write the lines. Because it is true, if you know who you are, you will know how to behave. Another point that we have tried to establish in our prayer <clears throat> discussion or study, is that every privilege demands responsibility. We ended our last study by looking at the tremendous privilege that believers have. We notice that in affirming the children, he stated that they had the wonderful experience of the forgiveness of sins. They also, like the fathers, were enjoying fellowship with the father. And the young men were experiencing victory over the evil one. Because the word of God is abiding in them.
Now, these privileges were designed to force them to behave in a way that would be diametrically opposite to the world's way of living. And that's why, although one very um, reputable commentator thinks that this paragraph is a digression, I don't think it is. Because what John the Elder is saying, that if you have experienced the forgiveness of sins, if you are enjoying this wonderful, intimate relationship with the Father, and if you have discovered the source of victory where you can be overcoming the evil one, then you should not love the world because the world as a system is diametrically opposed to the Father's will. And so for the first time in the epistle, John the Elder is giving a directive and the directive is what we find in our texts for today. So let's examine what he meant when for six times he, uh, he, he refers to the world. Now the world generally is used to think of creation, to think of earth, the planet. But in this epistle and in other epistles, the world is depicted as the godless system over which the powerful forces of the devil rules. In this system, the devil uses distortion, deceit, and sinful desires of the flesh and senses to perpetuate rebellion against God. In other words, the devil has come up with an alternative to God's plan, which on the surface seems easy, seems attractive, but according to God, it ends in death and darkness. This is why we read following the, 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 the words John in not in John 1 verse 10 that says that Jesus came, created the world, but the world did not know him. And therefore the world is described as in darkness. And in Colossians 1 we are told that Jesus Christ has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. That is the world system. And translated us into the kingdom of his son. First John 5 verse 19 states that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. This is what John is saying. Do not love the world because the world is not going to enhance your relationship with God. The world <clears throat> is not going to provide you with the forgiveness of sins. The world is going to keep you trapped and keep you in hostility and enmity towards God. James in chapter 4 verse 4 says, 
I want you to know that friendship with the world is enmity against God. Here, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, he says, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. How did this come about? He goes on to say, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of the flesh and senses, and were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. This is the world that John the Elder says, do not fraternize, do not become intimate, do not allow yourself to be influenced by this system, this godless system. Then he goes on to tell us in the paragraph, in the text, how the world works. He says, well, the world controlled by the great deceiver operates on the distorted view that the cravings of the sinful nature can be satisfied by its independence of God. This was what how he deceived Eve, telling her that if you obey me and disobey God, you won't need God because you'll become like God, knowing good from evil. Now, since the world does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't know the truth. First thing he did was to contradict the truth. Did God really say this? God does know. God is hiding something from you. So let me give you the whole truth. So since the world doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't know the truth, but instead it embraces the lie that indulging the desires of the fallen nature will bring lasting pleasure. Because he tricked her to see what was forbidden like all the other trees that God had made. All the other trees that God had made in chapter 2 verse 8 was pleasant to the eyes and good for food. But this one that God says you must not eat of it, he got her to see it as good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and that would make one wise. And that was a lie. So number one, it is using the fallen nature to entice us to believe a lie that what is forbidden, what God says is not good for you, is good. The world also works through the outward attractions. What you see with the eyes. The world also works through what is seen by the eyes without making sure of their value. Because what is beautiful is not always good. It is true that all that glitters is not gold. In fact, there is also such a thing as fool's gold. That is iron or copper, because it is yellow like gold, looks like gold, but it is not gold. And this is what the world does. This is what the devil has succeeded in doing 
and the entire human race is trapped into by this into believing things that are beautiful to be good when they are not good again he succeeded with Eve in Genesis 3 6 it was pleasant to the eyes as well as good for food Achan coveted the beautiful robe from Babylon but there was the prohibition don't take it leave it alone destroy it David Losting, looking at Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11, 2. Achan is Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, are examples of this. So John the Elder is saying, Beware. Examine. Examine whatever it is against the will of God, the word of God before you're drawn into it, before you embrace it as good. But the world also fosters pride in our achievements, boasting about what one has and what one does is another way that is cultivated by the world system. This occurs when God is robbed of our accomplishments when we think that we are the master of our own destiny when we think that we can lift ourselves by our own bootstrap because we are educated and experienced we are richly endowed we don't need God so we pride ourselves and we boast remember the devil's lie Remember what he says. God does know that you will become like God. And that is the biggest lie that he has ever told. But Eve believed it. When we talk about accomplishments, we are talking about our possessions. We are talking about our image, our status. We are talking about where we live. We're talking about how educated we are and we boast about it. And one of the one of the most dangerous thing is that it causes us to look down on others. Not only do we rob God of the credit so we don't give God the glory and give God the praise, but we look down on others thinking that we are better than them. When that is not true, that is not true. And so, how do we apply this? John was very straightforward. And as if there is no need for application, he just says directly, do not love the world and the things that are in the world, because those who love the world, do not love the Father. Now, I, I have <clears throat> alluded to Genesis 3 verse 6 already. But because of the law of first mention, I am constrained to refer to it again and to say, notice, that where the first Adam failed in Genesis chapter 3, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, was victorious in the temptation. And if you look at the temptations, the three temptations, they are exactly, they are similar to what we read in Genesis 3. Notice it started out with food for the body. turn stones into bread because you're hungry and you have the power to do it. Take the shortcut and do it. 
over in Genesis when she saw that it was good for food. I can get satisfaction from this. Remember, second temptation, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And I offer this to you, just like Eve, when she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. And then, why don't you just jump? For scripture says he'll give his angel charge concerning you. And they will greet, hey, 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 he's great, God is with him. The devil uh, got her to think that this is something to be desired to make one wise, which is a which is false, which is a distortion, which is an illusion. What can you eat to make you wise? What is it? But she was made to believe it. And this is what the devil tried with the last Adam. But thank God, he did not fail the test. Like Christ, by way of application, with word and spirit. Because when we go back to Matthew or Mark or Luke, we, we can't miss the fact that Jesus went in the 40 days filled with the Holy Spirit, driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And he came out of the wilderness filled with the Holy Spirit. So the 40 days of hunger, the 40 days of fasting, the temptation of the devil did not cause his fullness to be depleted. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit continuously, which is our goal. We don't want to be filled on Sunday morning and then on Monday and Tuesday and the other days we are loving the world and we are controlled by the world system. We want to be constantly controlled by the Spirit of God because you know, Paul and Galatians talk about the conflict between the Spirit and the flesh, the Spirit and the war against each other. But we want to be controlled by the Spirit. And notice three times, or every time, or each time, whatever way you, you state it, his response was, his weapon was the Word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. No wonder Paul calls the Word of God the sword of the Spirit. So the Spirit was using the Word of God in the life of Jesus Christ and caused him to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Finally, in this same epistle, this same letter, we read that the victory there's a victory that overcomes the world. And here is how it is written. I think it's written in chapter, in chapter 5. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. Isn't that beautiful? That we are positioned to conquer. We are born of God. What we are made out of and what we have become have positioned us and equipped us to conquer the world, the world system, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And this is the victory that conquers the world. What is it? Our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So, you see, we are ending this study on the right note, considering the Lord Jesus and the way he conquered the world 
the flesh and the devil. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus was manifested to defeat, to destroy the works of the devil. And didn't he do that? He surely did. Right of the Hebrew says that very clearly. That Jesus destroyed him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. And has liberated us who all our lifetime were subject to bondage. And so the deeper we, we our faith is in Jesus Christ, is the more victorious we will become. Because we don't have to go to any university or any guru or any program in order to be victorious. The fact that we are born of God. The fact that we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. The fact that Jesus who died and rose and is at the Father's right and interceding for us guarantees us victory over the world, the flesh and the devil. Stories told of a group of people who went on a tour of a mint. A mint is where coins are made. They were shown the stages in which the metal was heated. Started out with it becoming red hot. And the guide says, well, you know, a metal is not at its hottest when it is red hot. When the metal is at its hottest, it is white hot. So they got to the point where it was white hot. And the guide said to them, you know, as hot as the metal is, if you were to dip your hand in water, and I were to pour this white hot metal in your hand, you know, it wouldn't burn you. And everybody bowed their head and says, yes, yes. And so he turned to the, the, the gentleman who was next to him and he says, well, do you believe it? He said, yes, yes, yes. And he said, well, if you believe me, why don't you stretch out your hand and let me pour some water in and then I'll pour the metal in. So he looked at his hand. He looked at the water. He looked at the metal. He says, no, it's okay, man. I believe you. I believe you but he wouldn't stretch out his hand. So he turned to one of the ladies and he says, do, do you really believe me? And she said, yes. So she stretched out her hand. He poured the water in. He poured the metal in. And guess what? It didn't burn her. So he turned to the gentleman and he said, the trouble with you men is, that you believe me, but you don't trust me. Now, in view of the fact that we are faced with the enemy of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and that the prescription for victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil is our faith, and faith is more than just intellect, giving an intellectual assent to the fact. But faith is trusting Jesus Christ with all your heart, with all of your being. Do you really trust him? Are you going to trust and trust your life with him? Because you and I, no matter how experienced, how long we have been Christians, how we know the Bible, cannot overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil in our own strength. But Jesus Christ has demonstrated that his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and the fact that he lives in the power of an endless life, that he can, has, will continue to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, then let us entrust our lives to him so that 
with the help of the word and spirit, we will overcome and become better disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. Father, let us ask you to bless your words to our hearts and glorify yourself, we pray, and cause that we will not only experience the forgiveness of sins and fellowship with the Father, but as the young men in our text experience, overcoming the evil one, because the word of God abides in us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat>